This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Flat fourth. Stocks start the second half of the year not exactly with a bang. Still, they do head into the 4th of July weekend higher, barely, after the best weekly gains of the year. Second half scorecard, a look at the tug of war taking place in the market right now and where stocks might go from here. And all American picks. Our market monitor says if you believe in the good old U.S. of A., then he's got three stocks for you. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, July 1st. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second half of the year. The fireworks on Wall Street fizzled a bit today after all the pyrotechnics in the last week stemming from Britain's vote to leave the European Union. But after a tumultuous start, it turned out to be the best weekly gain for stocks so far this year. Today was the fourth straight up day gain, small one, for stocks. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 19 points to close at 17,949. The Nasdaq added just about 20, and the S&P 500 tacked on four, but closed above the psychologically important 2100 level. I know I feel psychologically better for that. <laughs> for the week, all the indexes rose more than 3%, with the S&P having its biggest percentage gain in about eight months. So we now know how the first half ended and the second half started. The question for investors now is, what's next? Bob Pisani takes a look at the issues stocks face that could be market movers in the second half of the year. It's the start of the second half of the year, and after an already tumultuous first half, the big question is, where do we go from here? The main issue is the tension between the bulls who insist on Tina, you know, there is no alternative to stocks, and the bears who believe valuations and earnings estimates remain way too high and that the markets will move lower in the second half of the year. Tina's not quite right. You know, there are alternatives. It always has been. Money continues to pour into high-yield and municipal bond ETFs, and, of course, there's always gold. Gold hit a two-year high today, and that's giving a major boost to gold ETFs like the GLD. As for earnings, uh, while they will not collapse, estimates for an increase in the second half are dependent on a lot of things going right. There's two big issues. First, lower interest rates and a strong dollar. Lower rates for longer will likely be a big problem for banks, particularly if the yield curve remains relatively flat because the banks make money on higher rates and on a greater difference between long and short-term rates. A dollar spike is another big issue. A spike in the dollar at the end of last year turned into a huge problem for materials, industrials, energy, and many technology stocks, all of whom cited dollar strength as impacting profits at that time. Besides earnings, there's plenty of other events that could move the markets, like the U.S. presidential elections, all of which could throw an additional monkey wrench into the markets. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Bassani at the New York Stock Exchange. June auto sales are showing the American consumer is still buying cars and trucks at a near record pace, although that pace is gradually slowing down. It's further proof that auto sales appear to have hit a plateau. And as Phil LeBeau tells us, that could mean good news for Americans looking to buy a new vehicle in the second half of the year. The 4th of July weekend should be a busy one at auto dealerships around the country. A relatively healthy economy, low interest rates, and high consumer confidence will convince many consumers this is the time to buy new wheels. June sales for the largest automakers were roughly in line with estimates, with Fiat Chrysler continuing to grow sales year over year thanks to strong demand for Jeeps. The brand remains red hot despite negative headlines about the death of an actor linked to a recalled Grand Cherokee. Overall, pickup truck sales are seeing double-digit growth thanks in part to a strong housing market and low gas prices. But after seven years of surging sales, many Americans have replaced their old car or truck with a new one. So dealers are having to work a little harder to close sales. That means if you're looking to buy in the second half of this year, you'll likely find hefty incentives to sweeten the deal. Whether or not the industry can top last year's record sales is up for debate. Despite the inventory of new vehicles growing, Automakers have yet to make major production cuts for the second half of this year. Many are hoping that July and August, which are typically two of the busiest months of the year, will once again deliver hot summer sales in the auto industry. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. 
Well, not only is today the start of the second half, it's also the first day of the fiscal year for states, and new laws take effect all across the country. Jane Wells takes a look at some of the new ones and rather unusual ones that go on the books from coast to coast. Many so-called normal new laws are taking effect today across the country, like here in Los Angeles. Uh, the first of many new minimum wage hikes begin. The minimum wage now going up to $10.50. There's a, a law going to effect here that you can no longer wear earbuds in both ears while you're driving a car or bicycling. But there are the unusual laws and the ones that raise eyebrows, including one here in California, where for the first time, professional cheerleaders like the Raiderettes must now be paid minimum wage, have sick leave, and the same worker protections as team staff. In Virginia, don't feed Bambi. Feeding deer now carries a $50 fine. In Maryland, powdered alcohol, which is apparently a thing, will remain illegal for two more years. Vermont has enacted the first GMO labeling law, so Coca-Cola reportedly will be pulling some lower volume products off shelves rather than spend the money on labeling in the home of Bernie Sanders. And Indiana has made sawed off shotguns legal. Sawed off is any barrel 18 inches or shorter. By the way, starting today, Indiana will be charging fantasy sports sites $50,000 to operate in its state. But none of these laws are as weird as some of the laws that have been on the books for a very long time, including one in Connecticut where a cucumber isn't a cucumber unless it can bounce. And in Arizona, asses are banned from sleeping in bathtubs. And by that, I mean donkeys. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, Los Angeles. <laughs> no donkeys in the tub. That's really something. All right, manufacturing data from June showed a better, only on NBR do you get that so. <laughs> <laughs> showed a better than expected gain that manufacturing data did, signaling that things might be stabilizing in that important sector. Construction spending fell for the second straight month in May. This follows April's decline, which was the biggest monthly drop. In more than five years, the back-to-back -back declines could cause some economists to lower their second quarter growth forecast. There is no doubt that the Federal Reserve will have a lot on its plate in the second half of the year. Fed Vice Chair Stanley Fisher sat down with Sarah Eisen to talk all things economy. Everyone's trying to figure out what the Brexit effect will be on the U.S. economy and Fed policy. Federal Reserve Vice Chairman Stanley Fisher told me it's too soon to tell. We're going to have to wait and see. I mean, it, it clearly is a huge event for the U.K. and, for, and it's an important event for Europe. Uh, our direct uh, trade with, with uh, Britain is not, is, is not going to make a huge difference to us. But it could set off, uh, there are a lot of things that will follow from Brexit for Europe, for the United Kingdom. As for the U.S. economy overall, he's fairly optimistic that the data have looked better since that weak report on jobs back in May. The uh, U.S. economy, since the very bad data we got in May on, on uh, employment, has done pretty well. I mean, most of the incoming data look good. Now, you can't make a whole story out of two, two uh, a month and a half of data. But this, this is looking better than it had before. With Brexit raising the political risk around the globe, Fisher did warn that the election in the U.S. in November could raise uncertainty for business and impact hiring and investment. But he did say it won't influence the Fed. It is a source of uncertainty. It's not a source of uh, additional uncertainty, if any, about monetary policy. We will do what we have to do in accordance with the law. We are not going to get into, oh, it's the elections, we can't do anything. And while Fisher sounded relatively positive about the prospects for the U.S. economy, investors aren't so sure. In fact, if you look at the futures market, they're not pricing in a Fed interest rate increase until 2018. That means no action this year and none the following year. We'll see if the markets or the Federal Reserve has it right. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Sarah Eisen. It was a big month for Hillary Clinton as her campaign raised nearly $70 million in June. And while it was a good month for her, it hasn't been the best of weeks for the presumptive Democratic nominee, headlined by a meeting between Bill Clinton and Attorney General Loretta Lynch which led to damage control. John Harwood joins us uh, from Washington now with more. John, a strange political year just got odder. What went on and how? Well, look, this was a big mistake by uh, President Clinton and by Loretta Lynch to have this meeting. 
According to uh, Clinton and Lynch, uh, there was a chance meeting on an airport tarmac. They were both in separate airplanes. Bill Clinton uh, went to Loretta Lynch's plane. They've known each other. He appointed her U.S. attorney uh, in 1999. Uh, but given the fact that Loretta Lynch is overseeing the Justice Department's investigation of Hillary Clinton's emails, it was completely inappropriate for the meeting to take place, and it generated a political backlash. Yeah, and I know she addressed it at the Aspen Ideas Conference and basically said she will hold by the findings. Um, but, John, the optics, as you mentioned, don't look good. Is what she said today enough to take that particular story out of the headlines? I don't think so. Uh, Republicans are going to keep hammering this with good reason. Uh, Loretta Lynch said that th uh, herself that this had cast a shadow over the investigation. Uh, she said it wasn't going to affect it, but she said that that's how people view it in the outside. Well, uh, that is great fodder if you are a Republican politician trying to uh, hurt Hillary Clinton. Of course, some of this will depend on what the recommendation of those career prosecutors is and what happens you know she has not said she will recuse herself from the case sue she said she would simply accept the recommendation but as long as she's the attorney general and has not recused herself we don't know how she's mm -hmm. going to handle it and what that recommendation recommendation is going to be do we know anything about how this meeting came about was it just happenstance or was it i mean did somebody call somebody and say i'm going to be on the tarmac you want to get together <laughs> uh, according to what we've heard from uh, both camps, the uh, Bill Clinton uh, had uh, an airplane uh, on the tarmac. He'd been playing golf. Loretta Lynch had been uh, on business in Arizona. Bill Clinton saw that her airplane was there, uh, evidently understood whose airplane it was, and approached the airplane. And uh, again, not something he should have done. Uh, Loretta Lynch said she would not do it again, uh, but this was a mistake that was self-inflicted, and it's not good for Hillary Clinton. All right, John, thanks very much. Have a good 4th of July. John Harwood in Washington. Coming up, our market monitor says if you want to bet on the U.S. economy, there are three stocks you need to have in your portfolio. He'll tell us what they are in just a couple moments. A new working paper by the National Bureau of Economic Research suggests that some executives downplay corporate earnings guidance, leading to serious questions of the motivation behind that. Joining us is one of the authors, Ronnie Sadka. He's chairperson of the finance department at Boston College's Carroll School of Management. Welcome, sir. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Good to be here. As you did your research, what did you find? Well. Um, you know, this day and age, uh, we have a lot of uh, information. And, um, you know, let's say you want to go and, uh, uh, you know, buy a, a shirt in uh, The Gap, or you want to go buy groceries at, uh, um, let's say, Whole Foods. <clears throat> All of that information is stored. You're going to look at your phone. You're going to say, okay, where's the driving directions? What mm -hmm. are the store hours? So we can gauge all, all of that information and figure out um, our, pro our proxy for what corporate earnings are going to be. So you, you have a proxy there, and, and w what you found is that the executives who were talking about for giving forward guidance on a conference call where they would talk about their past quarter's earnings, that they would downplay the bullish forecasts. Uh, why? It's a good question. So I think there could be several, um, several explanations. But the way, the way we, we try to construct the research is we try to get information that actually is not really available uh, until today. And, and using this digital information, we can try to understand what managers knew. So the idea is we're looking at what man, what's going on during a fiscal quarter. And, and if we see that, let's say, consumer activity, uh, if our indicators say consumer activity is high, then we think it's going to be uh, it's good news. But what we find is when, when, it's, when it seems that the uh, activity uh, in the fiscal quarter is going well, 
in fact, what managers do is they downplay this information. So you're exactly right. We find that they uh, issue a pessimistic guidance. And in the conference call, the tone of the conversation typically seems to be more negative. So why can that, you know, why is that happening? Well, it could be they're trying to smooth earnings. It could be they're trying to manage earnings a bit and make it more smooth, underplay it, and therefore um, achieve less volatility for earnings, which is a good thing. But, you also but it could also be that there may be they're, they're worried about litigation risk, so they don't want to over, you know, over uh, promise anything. But you, the last, you, uh, uh, I guess, explanation could be that, that they're doing it for personal gain. And I think that's what, you're, that's what we alluded to in the, in the paper. All right. Yes, you, you, the, the abstract alleges that they may be motivated in part, and I'm reading from the abstract, by subsequent personal stock trading opportunities. So it sounds as though what you're saying is they downplay what's going well, and then they buy for their own account or they buy back shares. Is that, is that the allegation, or is that what the data showed you? Right. So some of the evidence, I mean, we have a very limited number of firms, so you need to understand that. But indeed, it's, it seems that, that when, when things are going well during the quarter and when managers underplay that, it seems that in the period right after the earning announcements, mm -hmm. it seems that there's an increased buying activity. And so the idea is exactly right. Perhaps this uh, activity is happening to a get a serious, lower price for their stock. That's a very serious mm -hmm, for allegation. Their, uh, stock. That's right. So I think it's, it's, it's still, you know, it's preliminary evidence. I mean, it's very hard to say this is not a smoking gun. I mean, we need to make an assumption that the managers indeed see what we see on our indicators. That's, I think that's a big assumption. We don't really know what they know when, you know, they make these, uh, um, these purchases. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's definitely some evidence that you kind of scratch your head, you know, what's going on mm. here. Okay. On that note, Mr. Sadka, thank you very much for joining us. Ronnie Sadka with Boston College's much. Carroll School of Management. Disney inks a deal with Major League Baseball, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. According to Bloomberg, the theme park and uh, media operator will buy a one-third stake in the video division of MLB Advanced Media. The price, $3.5 billion. As part of the deal, Disney will be given the option to buy an additional 33% stake within four years. Disney up 18 cents on the day at $98 even. Software giant Oracle has been ordered to pay $3 billion in damages to the computer maker Hewlett Packard. A California jury found that Oracle violated a contract by refusing to develop new software updates to support HP's Itanium con computer servers. Oracle said it will appeal the verdict. Shares of Oracle up $0.08 cents on the session at 40.86. Hewlett Packard Enterprises up 8% at 1849. Thor Industries, which makes recreational vehicles, is going to buy the privately held Jayco for nearly $580 million in an all-cash deal. Jayco will become a subsidiary of Thor. Its current management will remain intact. Shares of Thor Industries up nearly 7% on the session at $69.18. Nike co-founder Phil Knight has stepped down from his position as chairman of the athletic company's board of directors. The company's CEO will now take on the new chairman position, and Knight will become chairman emeritus, which means he can still oversee board meetings. Shares of Nike up marginally to 55.61. Nearly half of the board members of energy company Williams are calling it quit. Six members resigned after failing to remove the company's CEO following a failed merger attempt with rival energy transfer equity. Despite the resignations, Williams says it stands by the current CEO. Shares, though, fell nearly 5 percent to $20.56. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway has applied to keep and possibly expand its stake in Wells Fargo. An application to the Federal Reserve showed Buffett's personal stake in the bank combined with Berkshire's topped 10 percent because of buybacks by Wells Fargo, which reduced the amount of outstanding shares. The Federal Reserve must authorize any transactions that put an investor over the 10 percent threshold of any bank. Shares of Wells Fargo were relatively unchanged when the news came out in extended hours after closing the day down a fraction to 47.03. Our market monitor is betting on the future of the USA. He has some names that he says are going to benefit from economic growth over the next 10 years. This is his first time joining us on the program. He's Cole Smead of Smead Capital. Don't get nervous, Cole. It's okay. You're, you're, you're no rookie. I know you're not. Let's start with your second pick, which is the one Sue just mentioned, and that is Wells Fargo. Are you following yeah, Buffett so. here? If it's good enough for Buffett, it's good enough for Smead, right? Uh, well, I, you know, think of the circumstances of this last two weeks here with Brexit and all the 
conversations and the consternation around the banking industry. And here is a geriatrical old man who is very wealthy and greedy, and he out, he's out asking the regulator to buy more of what's the best residential real estate bank in America. Uh, he obviously has a very bright view of the future. We unequivocally agree with him. We own the stock as well. And we think much of what's gone on the last two weeks in terms of sentiment, people are getting, the, the, the opportunity of the next 10 years is being masked by the political and mm -hmm. other frustrations of today. Let's go to NRV Incorporated, the for, uh, nation's fourth largest home builder. Why do you like it? Uh, NVR has a great business because most home builders, uh, they develop land. NVR does not. They actually use an option pricing uh, model to get after land. They most profitably build homes in any, country, uh, any company in the United States of America. So once again, go back to Wells Fargo. You got, you got Buffett buying Wells Fargo. We have a ton of young people in this country that have yet to buy houses. And housing after the 08 depression that we dealt with in housing, uh, there are very few builders in relation to the past 10 years. Let's talk about your third choice, which is uh, not related to housing. It is, well, I guess you, you sell things for the house on eBay. Sure. eBay is your pick. A lot of people would notice right off the top that they get a lot of their revenue out of the UK. Are you worried Correct. about that? Uh, no, because it, they, they provide transactions. They're effectively the, the primary uh, e-commerce platform for a small business in America or the world for that matter. And what they provide is unique items. So let me give you an example, Tyler. I'm left-handed golfer. Mm -hmm. If I want to go buy a pair of used clubs, there's one market in the world that can provide me a unique item like that. Is it a commodity item? No. You can go to Amazon and Walmart and a bunch of other places for commodity items. But eBay is the unique item marketplace for the world. Cole, I'm going to put you together with our executive producer, who's also a left-handed golfer. You guys should <laughs> nice. talk. Cole nice. Smead with Smead Capital. Thank Thanks. You so much. Have a great fourth. Coming up next, there will be a record number of drivers on the road this holiday weekend. One guess what's fueling the traffic. Lower gas prices led to drivers racking up a record number of miles last year, more than three trillion of them. But it was also a deadly year. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says fatalities in 2015 rose nearly 8 percent to 35,000 the most in seven years. And naturally, those numbers come out as AAA says this weekend will be the busiest ever for drivers hitting the road. Thirty six million. Kate Rogers was among them today on the New Jersey Turnpike in Ridgefield. And she's got who's driving where and why. Hitting the road this long holiday weekend, odds are you're going to sit in traffic. AAA reports a record-breaking 36 million drivers will be right there with you, making it the third consecutive 4th of July weekend with an all-time high number of auto travelers. The reason why? Gas prices are at their lowest level since 2005. AAA reports the national average is at $2.28 per gallon, which has drivers eager to fill up and go. July 4th week, and I plan on uh, taking a long ride up. Uh, really have no destination. I'm just looking for a really long ride somewhere. Gas prices definitely help out. It's definitely a, a big incentive into like taking like long rides. Unless they get over the $4 range, I would. Uh, that's the only way I would reconsider driving. Thank God it's not like it was two years ago or three years ago. Thank God prices are lower. The highest gas prices nationwide are on the West Coast in California, then Hawaii, Alaska, Washington, and Nevada. The least expensive markets are South Carolina, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Alabama. But not everyone is traveling by car. A total of 43 million Americans will be traveling this 4th of July. 3.3 million will travel by air, the highest area of growth in AAA's survey. Another 3.2 will travel by cruise, rail, and bus. Still, some are avoiding travel altogether. I'm staying home. Why should I go? I have a beautiful pool and the roads are crowded. For Nightly Business Report in Ridgefield, New Jersey, I'm Kate Rogers. I'm with her. But if you are <laughs> planning to drive, you may use one of three popular traffic apps, Waze, Google Maps, or Apple Maps. So which one gets you where you want to go faster? Eric Chemi takes an unscientific look. 
It's road trip season, so which Maps app will get you out of traffic and onto summer fun the fastest? We put the apps to an unscientific test with three drivers, me on Google Maps, Nick on Waze, and Betsy on Apple Maps, starting at the same time for three legs. No racing to see which app gave the fastest route and the most accurate time estimate. The day had highs. What a beautiful day for a short road trip. And lows. So take me home. So how did the apps do? Google Maps and Waze, also owned by Google, were neck and neck for most of the drives, with my Google Maps edging out a slight lead. Wonder if we won. Apple Maps gave Betsy three straight last place finishes. We've been waiting here for a while. So this 4th of July, we're giving Google Maps three fireworks for fastest and most accurate routes. Waze gets two fireworks, and Apple Maps limps into third with just a sparkler. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eric Chemi. And finally tonight, the 4th of July, is when we celebrate our country's independence, of course, and boy, do we celebrate. According to WalletHub, Americans will spend more than $6.5 billion on July 4th food, including 150 million hot dogs, 900 million pounds of beef and chicken. Also, the nation's top beer-drinking holiday, you might not be surprised <laughs> to learn. In fact, Nielsen says we spend more than $1.7 billion over the 4th on beer and a half a billion more on wine. That's just my house. <laughs> <laughs> That's a party, right? <laughs> you got it. Hope you guys have a great fourth. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for watching. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Y'all come on over. Have a great holiday Be weekend. Careful. We'll see you back here on Monday.